Hello, this is Mrs. Baruch, and we are going to talk about energy and metabolism and how enzymes in organisms uh, control all the chemical reactions in our uh, body and how chemical uh, reactions harness energy and release energy. Now, um, if you remember, the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy is basically what's called stored energy or the potential to do work. And kinetic energy is that release energy or um, motion. So that boy, he's st just by standing there in that position, he has potential energy because he has potential to jump down. And as this guy has kinetic energy, and then the boy on the bottom has less potential energy than the boy on the top of the rock. So life basically follows those universal laws of thermodynamic. And the first law is where energy is converted, not destroyed or created. And the second law of entropy is where heat is released when energy is transformed, which adds to disorder or entropy in a universe, which means that anytime energy is transformed from one form to another, like light to chemical, you always lose some of that energy as heat. And that heat energy increases the disorder in the universe. So in life, energy is required and is highly ordered. Now, like I said, life is an order system that needs constant flow of energy. So life is built on that chemical energy which is released and stored through chemical reactions. So our ultimate source of energy is, of course, the sun. And that sunlight is harnessed and converted to chemical energy by taking carbon dioxide and water and converting that to chemical energy in terms of food. Uh, and that process is, of course, photosynthesis. And then, as you can see, that giraffe is consuming that chemical energy and converting that. So this energy flows throughout the ecosystem. So the, the giraffe is eating the plants, the producers, and then that giraffe is going to be eaten by uh, carnivore. So again, as you can see, energy flows through the ecosystem. Now, chemical reactions of life involves key processes of life. And all these processes, all these chemical reactions is what we refer to as metabolism. So metabolism is all the chemical reactions in the organism. And all the re chemical reactions have something called reactants and when they react together, they produce a product. So in life, we have molecules that are being built, or we say synthesis, for example, like protein synthesis. So you have reactants, and you get a product. Or you have uh, reactions that break down molecules, for example, like in digestion. So you break down, say, a starch molecule into separate sugar molecules. Now. We know that some chemical reactions either absorb energy and release energy to break or form bonds between atoms. So reactants is what goes in and products is what comes out. So that activation energy is the energy needed to start many chemical reactions. So activation energy is the energy to get the reaction started. So any reaction that needs to be needs a little push to get started otherwise it's not going to happen so think about uh, rolling a ball over a hill that hill represents active energy so biological catalysts that we call enzymes uh, speed up that chemical reaction by lowering that activation energy and most enzymes are proteins now there's an exception where we have an enzyme that's an RNA and we'll talk about that next semester. So an enzyme basically has an active site. An active site is basically an area where the substrate, and the substrate is basically the reactant, binds to that active site. And when it binds to the active site, then the reaction occurs. So the enzymes lower the activation energy so the reaction can occur faster. So think about, again, the man rolling the ball over the hill. All right, so that hill represents the energy that it requires for that ball to get going. And what enzyme does is lowers that hill 
so that reaction occurs faster. So, but if you look at it chemically here, here's the enzyme. The lactose is a sugar, in this case, binds to an enzyme called lactase. And this stresses and allows that bond to break easily. And then you have the product, which is two sugars, glucose and galactose. So graphically, we depict uh, enzyme uh, lowering activation energy by this. So here's a graph. You have time, energy, and this hill you see up here is activation energy. So notice how that peak is lowered with the enzyme. And as you can see, the product is lower in energy versus the reacting, and basically that energy is released. So we could say this energy is um, released, and this reaction is exergonic. Now, so energy releasing reactions are called exergonic reactions. So here's another way of seeing this. And you notice the product is lower in energy versus the reactant. Now, if energy is being absorbed, that reaction is called endergonic. So notice here, you have reactants and the product is higher in amount of energy, so energy was needed to input it. So, for example, like in photosynthesis. So, proteins have a structure that complements its function. So, everything about enzymes is about the protein's shape. And if you remember about proteins, protein has a particular structure determined by the sequence of the amino acid, and they could be folded in alpha or pleated, and that further gets folded, and you have other chemical reactions happening, and then it has this particular shape. So it has different stages of shape. So this shape what determines how an enzyme reacts. So the active site has a particular shape that is complementary to a substrate. So here, in this case, a substrate is shape is complementary to the enzyme. So if it's not complementary, that substrate cannot bind to that active site. So, so in this case, we have this substrate, the red one in this case, is the correct substrate. So this is the substrate, or in other words, the reactant. And then here we have the active site where the substrate binds. And each type of enzyme um, breaks down a particular substrate. So for example, sucrase, it breaks down sucrose, protease breaks down protein, and so forth. So going over again what an enzyme reaction is, first of all, you have an enzyme. Uh, notice, again, shape matters, and its shape is complementary to a reactant, which is a substrate. And the substrate then binds to the enzyme at the active site, forming an enzyme-substrate complex. And this is where the reaction occurs, and once the reaction has occurred, the enzyme is released, and then it's reusable, and then you have your products. So to summarize the characteristics of enzymes, the most enzymes are proteins. They speed up a chemical reaction. That's what they call the catalyst. They uh, speed up the reaction by lowering that activation energy. They're specific to one enzyme. Um, the enzyme is not changed by the chemical reaction and it can be recycled. And enzymes, just like any other protein, can be denatured or means it comes out of shape due to probably temperature or pH. So enzymes aren't used up, or in other words, they are recycled. So therefore, small amounts of enzymes are required. So here's another way to picture enzyme substrate uh, reaction. So again, you have your substrate that binds to an enzyme at the active site, forming the enzyme substrate complex. After the reaction, the products are released, and so enzymes are recycled. So again, shape matters, and there's two types of models. Uh, one is that the lock and key model, right, just as a key fits into a lock and, and a substrate fits with the enzyme. Now there's also another model called the induced fit model, meaning the enzyme adjusts its shape to fit that substrate. So if you look at this, here's an enzyme, the red is a substrate, and when you bind, it moves, it adjusts its shape, and that's called induced shape or induced fit. So enzyme shape is determined by its order of amino acid. 
So that's, of course, determined by the recipe, which is held in the DNA molecule. So the DNA molecule determines the sequence of the amino acid or chains of amino acid, and that gives you a particular shape of a folded protein. Now, if the DNA has a mistake, the chain of amino acid will be different, and your folded protein will have the wrong shape. Okay, so review and describe how sucrase reactions occur with the substrate sucrose. So remember, one, you have an enzyme which has a particular active site. And at this active site, only substrate sucrose can bind to it. Once the sucrose binds to it, we call it enzyme substrate complex. And once a reaction happens, in this case, adding water, hydrolysis occurs, breaking the bond and forming two products. So as you see, the shape of the enzyme determines enzyme reaction. And there are several factors that affect shape, such as temperature, pH, or salinity, which means the amount of salt. And that maintains that correct protein structure. So here, for example, you see the effect of temperature on the rate of enzyme reaction. Now think about biological organisms. What are the range of temperatures? So as humans, our temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius or uh, 90. 8.7 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So that's where most of our enzyme uh, have the most uh, rate of activity. But if you get too hot or too cold, then that reaction doesn't occur. So what is happening to the enzyme? So think about enzymes in terms of movement of molecules. As temperatures increase, the movement of molecules increase. So if you look at the slope uh, here at the graph, You can explain this graph as you're going up towards 37 degrees, uh, the reaction is increasing. But as you go and then reaches 37 degrees, that's the optimal. And after the optimal, the rate of the reaction starts decreasing because it's just going so fast that the shape of the enzyme uh, denatures or comes out of shape. And when it denatures, the active site gets uh, denatured and therefore the substrate cannot bind to it anymore. Um, so the effect of temperature on the rate of enzyme, again, you have an optimal temperature and if it gets too cold, the movement of molecules are too slow, but as the temperature increases, the collision between the enzyme and substrate increases and here again you have the optimal point right there and as you decrease, as the temperatures increase past this optimal temperature, enzyme starts coming out of shape. Okay. So question uh, in the real world here is how do cold-blooded animals adapt to this wide range of temperatures? I mean they too have that similar range to mammals but what are some adaptations that allows them to live in certain areas? Now mammals uh, use a lot of energy to maintain their body temperature where reptiles don't use that much energy, but they'll move to that particular environment to adjust to that temperature. So again, enzyme shape is affected by something pH. Now, if you remember, the definition of pH is the amount of hydrogen ions in that environment. So as pH changes, the shape can change because it's interacting with the uh, amino acids. So there's an optimal range of pH. So in, in normal uh, biological spectrum, most of it is in a neutral area, um, except like for your stomach, it's probably more acidic. So here it shows that you have a range that this uh, enzyme works best. And as you go, pa go to the extremes of this pH, the enzyme uh, gets denatured or out of its shape and therefore cannot function properly. So um, we need to learn how to read graphs when it comes to like optimum temperatures and pHs. So here again, pH and temperature are kind of similar, that they have a range where they work. So for example, in stomach, it works in very acidic conditions. So probably graph A would probably be a stomach environment. Uh, somewhere in neutral area, like between seven was basically like our blood and basic very basic areas you'd find that in your large intestines 
So 